RadioNetwork.com. Look, we back live. Nouveau Barbershop Plus, 6516 D, Central Avenue, Capitol Heights, Maryland. It's OG Radio. I'm your host, Empire Life, Damian, man. Uh, it's time to get started. We got our first guest of the evening. The president of the National African American Gun Association, Phil Smith. Phil, you there? Can you hear me? Let's try this again. Hello? There we go. Can you hear us, Phil? Yes, I can. Excellent, excellent. Um, first and foremost, thank you for taking time out of your schedule to speak with us. It's an honor to have you on the show. Oh, thanks for having me. I'm definitely uh, excited to talk to you guys. Um, so... We want to get right into it. Um, I actually found out about the National African American Gun Association a few months ago, um, just l really doing some research before I made my uh, first purchase of a firearm. Um, as, as the president, can you give us a little bit of history um, on the National African American Gun Association? Sure, sure. Um, the organization was founded in February t on February 28th of uh, 2015. Uh, in honor of Black History Month, and the goal, focus, total, de dedicated effort of the organization is to have Af African Americans nationwide learn about firearms, learn how to shoot, learn how to hold a gun, how to stand, uh, which, the, which, which is the correct stance, how to breathe, what caliber might be the best for you, um, 380 versus a 45 versus a 9 millimeter, ARs versus AK-47, whatever you like to know, we go over it from the very beginning to the very end. So you are totally comfortable when going to the range either outside or, or inside. And we have certified trainers uh, in all of our chapters nationwide. And we have over uh, 32 chapters as of right now and over 20,000 uh, members nationwide. Wow, okay, all right. Um, now, what uh, parts of the country do you have chapters located in? We're all over, um, primarily the Southeast and Northeast, but we do have uh, several in the Midwest, and as of right now, we have three in California. In fact, uh, Los Angeles uh, is our fastest-growing chapter with, with well over, I think, 200 members right now. So um, we're definitely gaining ground. Last year this time, we only had four chapters. This year, as I said before, we have over 32. So we've grown exponentially, and uh, that's a good thing. Uh, people are really t taking note and kind of asking themselves, you know, do I need a firearm? And if so, um, let's go to NAG and uh, – uh, definitely get that training that they need. So we're, we're excited and uh, very happy about what's happening. Excellent, excellent. Um, now, right, we've seen a rise, and I've read a lot of stories. Um, I actually saw you guys, a uh, piece that was done on CNN, and I read a couple stories in different um, publications about the rise um, in African-American gun ownership um, in recent times. A lot of people attributed it to the current administration, a lot of the rhetoric that has come from um, different organizations from the alt-right to the KKK to things of that nature. From your perspective, yeah. what has been some, in your opinion, um, what has caused the biggest boom in these gun purchases by our community? I, I think it's a three-headed monster. One, you know, crime, obviously. Uh, people nowadays are really being, you know, you know, thinking about where they're going, coming from work late at night or early in the morning, uh, getting carjacked, robbed. So that's a, a constant, as, as everyone knows out in society. You have to be careful because it can happen anywhere, any place. You getting, uh, you know, getting attacked. Uh, two uh, is the fact that there's the, the threat of terrorism. You know, we watch TV, we see what's happening over in France and the Middle East, and and, you know, and we've seen what has happened in South Carolina and San Bernardino, and it, quite frankly, it scares a lot of black folks. I mean, you look at that and we're like, you know what? I think I might need a gun just in case something happens. I want to be prepared, as opposed to not being prepared. Um, but I'd be lying to you. The third uh, reason, and that is some of the political and racial rhetoric that we've seen in the last 14, 16 months uh, from a number of folks, including the present administration, 
uh, and, and the White House said, has really fueled, I think, and this is purely my perspective, uh, a lot of folks that were in the fringes that we thought we would never hear and see are now boldly walking around, and just for lack of uh, a better way of describing it, describing it right now, I think people are. It's cool to be. It's cool to be a racist. It's very trendy. Um, you can say certain things, and if someone challenges you on that fact, you can say, "Well, you know, I'm just having free speech." No, it's not free speech. You're being a racist, and you're fueling very um, divisive, uh, you know, type of a mindset and philosophy. So those three factors have really fueled our organization. Um, we are not monolithic at all. We have different views. We have black Democrats, black Republicans, gay, straight. Grumpy, you know, but you name it, we have those type of individuals on and in our organization, which is a good thing. Uh, we are 60 percent African American women, believe it or not. Um, black women have really, really stepped up nationwide in joining. Um, they continue on a monthly and daily basis, outnumbering the men in terms of joining uh, the organization, and that, we think that's a good thing. So there, there's, those are the three main factors, but I definitely believe that. Uh, the latter is uh, which really has a lot of black folks concerned about what's what, where the country's going in terms of the direction and more importantly what kind of climate do you see out there uh, in you know in society when you're going about doing your business okay okay excellent now uh with you how did how did what was your first experience um with firearms how did you get started um you know shooting at the range purchasing your own firearms like what's your history with firearms yeah, I'll be, I'll be honest. I'm a California kid. I was born and raised in California, a little town called Vallejo, and uh, what we call the south side of town. And uh, growing up, we didn't really talk about guns in our, at, at the dinner table with my mother and father. We didn't. My mother and father weren't negative against guns or positive. It just wasn't a conversation. But I moved to Atlanta in 2002, and it's a completely different culture out here. Everyone has guns. Uh, you know, fathers give their guns down to their sons, their grandsons, mothers give it to their daughters. When you go to family reunions, black or white, they have shooting contests. It's just part of the culture of the Deep South. And for lack of a better word, I caught the bug and uh, went to the range a couple of times with uh, some guys that I work with. And uh, they literally had to pull me there the first couple of times. But after that, I really enjoyed myself. And I said to, my, so my, I said to myself at that particular time, if I can enjoy myself here, I know other African-Americans uh, would enjoy it as just as much as I am. So I looked around. I didn't see any other faces that looked like me. Um, and I went home and said, okay, I'm going to put together an organization that speaks to us, specifically for us, that resonates culturally and socially to our community. And that's what I did. And uh, uh, February 28th in 2015, I launched the website. I did not think uh, we'd get more than 300 people, but we had over 300 people within the first 45 days. Within the first year, we got over 8,000, and now we're well over 20,000 and growing. Um, so that was the the origin, the origin of the organization, and that's where we are right now. So it's been a it's been a surprise. I didn't think we we'd be here, to be honest, but but, but we are here. Well, I'm glad you're here. I'll be actually be um, officially signing up for my membership this week, so I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> you know? uh, well, thank you. <laughs> I'm definitely going to take take my do my part and sign up this week. Um, so one of the things that we wanted to touch on uh, while we had an opportunity with you, um, everyone's aware right. of the, the Philando Castile verdict um, that came down mm -hmm. uh, last week. Um, and there, you know, been a lot of voices ever since this case or, or this, this incident went public um, based on a response or lack of response from the National Rifle Association. Um, and I, I saw a lot of things where people were, you know, giving their point of views on why they haven't spoken up, why they haven't um, uh, voiced, voiced any statement on it. From the NNA, NAAGA's perspective or your perspective, why do you think that the NRA has shied away from this issue? I don't know. I, I obviously I can, I can speculate and I have my, my, my thoughts and, and my perspective on it, but I, I just don't know. I would think it would go a long way. Um, for their organization. Now, obviously, I can't speak for them, and I'm not trying to speak for them, but what I will say this. If you're an organization such as they are, and they are the largest, they're the big boy in the block. Everyone knows about them. They're well-funded. They have millions and millions of dollars. They have over 5 million members. Um, if they were to speak on it, um, obviously, a lot of people would, uh, would take note of that, and particularly if they were able to support uh, the African-American community from, in terms of our perspective, I think that would go a long way in driving uh, folks to really start looking to them with some you know, level of legitimacy. Um, but why? The reasons I don't know. I know from NAG's perspective, uh, we believe that there was a 
serious in, injustice done to uh, the Castile family and Philando Castile. Um, I looked at that tape probably 20, 30 times, and from my perspective, it was it was an execution. I'm not going to say the cop was a bad person, but he certainly did a bad thing and needs to pay for that. Um, I don't think when he woke up that morning, he said, you know, I'm going to kill Philando Castile, but certainly the seeds of discomfort or um, not feeling comfortable with African Americans was already there, and uh, it was just acted out when he approached Philando Castile um, at the window of his car. Um, so it's just very, very unfortunate. Um, and I, I want to say this to make sure everyone understands our perspective and, more importantly, what I believe is a solution. Personally, I'm tired of crying. I'm tired of yelling. I'm tired of marching. I am tired of um, the endless efforts that our community has done thus far. We have to start looking at how can we change the laws that the policemen are using as the shield when they interact with African Americans or anybody for that matter. And I'm not going to paint a brush of negativity on all police officers because most of them do a great good job. I have a lot of police officers that are friends of mine. We have discussions. We have disagreements. Um, and this is one of them. Um, there's a uh, Supreme Court decision, Garner versus Tennessee in 1985, that set the precedent of when an officer believes he or she is in danger um, by a suspect, they can use lethal force. From that point, 1985, and it was reinforced in 1989, they have used that time and time again as a shield to protect themselves legally. And I would say it's time for us to legally go after that law and change the law because the threshold that they're using um, just being scared, to me, from my perspective, is not enough. It's not good enough reason to kill a black man, or any man for that matter, or a woman. You have to have something tangible. I'm being attacked. Somebody's shooting at me. I understand that. But just saying I'm scared just isn't, doesn't, doesn't cut it with me anymore, and I, and I just refuse to accept that. So I, my perspective is we need to legally form some super legal teams across the country, various civil rights lawyers, and let's go after the law. Um, as Such as, I'll give an example, as the gay community has done for their particular focus. Um, NAACP, NAACP back in the 60s when they had um, the perspective and the strategy of going after the, the Voting Act rights and other laws that were affecting African Americans negatively. We need to do that or revisit that strategy from a legal perspective because the, the marching up and down the streets aren't doing anything but giving uh, the media photo shoots and uh, we have to change that. And I'm trying to organize something along those lines right now. Okay. Okay. Um, now, when you look at other communities, specifically um, the white community, like you said before, you see a lot of times, especially in, in the South, situations where firearms are passed down from generation to generation. The training is there at, at an early age, the experience. Um, they become very comfortable with um, firearms. Why do you think that hasn't happened in our community? I can remember at a time when my grandfather had a rifle, a handgun, but there, I, I, I've never really seen in my lifetime situations where you would have um, black parents, grandparents taking their kids, grandkids to the range, teaching them about firearms, giving them experiences with it. Why do you think that's, that's something that hasn't really been focused on um, from a generational standpoint in our community? It's funny. I was just talking about this with a friend earlier today. I think from a historical perspective, that – part of our heritage, and a lot of us, and most of us come from the South that have moved up to the North or California or, or, or New York, wherever you, 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 you might have uh, moved in terms of your family's path to getting where you are right now. But culturally, back in the day, back in the, in, in the South, everyone hunted. We all shot. We all fished. I mean, it was just a part of our community. But when you move to the big cities, that has been taken away from you because you don't have access to that. And that combined with the very, very aggressive Nonviolent perspective that has been really, and I'm not going to talk about any specific leaders, but to really shove down the African American community saying you don't need a gun to protect yourself is just the wrong mindset. And that mindset has just really influenced uh, a number of generations within our community. And now a lot of us that are good folks, I'm not going to sit there and say they're, they're, they're a, bad, a very bad person, but they really believe that not having a gun is the best way you can protect your community. And it's crazy. We're the only community that not having guns is good. In the Jewish community, they have guns because they, they understand the value of protecting their heritage and their family. Um, the Asian community, they understand they have to protect their, their family. The white community, they understand they have to protect their family, their family. But for some reason, when it comes to black folks, we don't need guns because it's bad for us. 
and it's just it's crazy. It's the most insane thing I've ever heard in my life. So um, I'm totally against any kind of conversation with anyone, for that matter, saying, well, Phil, you're better off with your family by not having any type of guns in the house uh, at night when you're trying to, trying to sleep. So we have to change the mindset because it's been really wiped uh, and placed upon our minds and just really brainwashed and bleached out. So we have to educate ourselves again, educate our, educate our kids, our, our girls, our boys, our women, our men on having a gun is a good thing if used properly. If you're trained properly, legally get your paperwork in order, get trained, know the laws of that particular state, there's nothing wrong with you carrying a gun. And that's something we have to really grasp and understand. It's okay to exercise your Second Amendment rights. You're not a discounted citizen. You're not a shuffling Negro that just barely got in the door. No, you're, your forefathers fought and died for you to stand right here today. So um, that's the mindset we have to do. We have to re-educate ourselves and, and understand that we have the right to carry a gun. Excellent, excellent. Um, now, I, I want to get your opinion on something because um, I reside in Maryland currently, um, and when I went um, to purchase a handgun, I think in 2013, um, they passed a law that requires Maryland residents to um, get a handgun qualification uh, license, the HQL. Um, and there was a lot of uh, fight back from the community because people started feeling like basically you were being charged if you wanted to exercise your Second Amendment rights. So basically you had to take a class that could range anywhere from um, a four-hour class that would range from anywhere from uh, $50 to $400, depending on who was holding the class, um, $75 for your hand print, I mean, uh, fingerprint, I think like another $50 for a background check. And then once you got your handgun qualification license, now when you go to make a purchase, you have to fill out an entire new form for the Maryland State Police that takes a week to process. Um, and a lot of people feel like all of this is being done to deter people from purchasing um, firearms. Um, is that something that you see in other states, or do you think that's something that's, you know, kind of confined to, like, the, the, the northern states? It, 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 you, you, I think you hit a very sensitive point that, that a lot of folks have noticed. Anytime, or just about any time, I can't say every time, but just about any time you have a large group of African Americans, you have laws which are going to be um, very hard to overcome in terms of purchasing uh, a gun, extra paperwork. They're going to make you pay a, a very large amount to get your license. Um, you have to take an excessive amount of classes. And you really see that in areas where there's large pockets of African Americans. If you go out to the rural areas throughout the, U the U U.S., in various states, it's very, very easy to get guns. If you come to Georgia, particularly in the, in the rural areas, you just buy the gun, show them your license, they run the background check right there, and you can literally walk out of the store with your gun. So I'm just upset that those laws are in place, and I think we should try to fight them at every you know turn uh, to get them reversed because it, it's financially making it difficult for folks to protect themselves, and I think that's, I think that's wrong. Yeah, I literally had to pay six hundred dollars before I could go spend another, you know, sum to actually pick up my gun. And I'm talking about from the, from the time that I took. Let me see. So I uh, it took literally probably a week, maybe a couple days longer than a week, to purchase and pick up my firearm. It, it's 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 crazy. It's crazy up here. And, I, and like I said, like you said, yeah. down in Georgia, it's a lot easier. I actually remember my first time. Going to Atlanta, um, as soon as we pulled off 85 into the city, we got behind a car um, at a left turn signal, and the light turned green. He didn't immediately move. We waited a couple seconds and hit the horn, and the guy literally got out and had a firearm on his side and literally looking at us like, what's the issue? And we were taken aback because coming from Maryland, D.C. <laughs> area, we're not used to seeing just casual citizens walking around with firearms. You know what I mean? Yeah, because they, they they open carry and can still carry every day out here. A lot of folks do. So, yeah, that you're, you're absolutely correct. Absolutely. Now, do you think that open carry and concealed carry uh, states, do you think those states um, generally will have lower rates of gun violence because of the lack of, you know, or, or actually the knowledge that, look, the next person may actually have a gun, so as opposed to, me pulling out my gun and getting in a shootout with somebody, we'll find another way to work this out. Do you think those concealed carry and open carry uh, permits actually keep gun violence down? I think common sense uh, dictates the day. If you're a crook 
and you're looking for a victim, who would you choose? Are you going to pick somebody that's got a side up, like you said, on, on, on their holster and you can see it? Or are you going to pick somebody walking down the street in an area where you know they don't have guns? I'm going to go to the area where they don't have guns. Uh, I don't know the statistics behind it, but I believe that folks that have open carry uh, and concealed carry in those particular states, I think the crimes would be would be down. Um, common sense to me, if I'm a, if I'm a, a crook, somebody that's going to rob somebody, I don't want any difficulty. I don't want I want at least pushback as possible. So I'm a big advocate of of, of open carry and concealed carry, even though I don't really open carry myself. Okay. Okay. Now, I'm sure you're aware uh, up in D.C. last week there was the shooting at the congressional softball practice um, of Steve Scalise. Yeah. Um, and now new legislation has been proposed that would allow um, members of the Congress and Senate to carry firearms in D.C., which, have ver which has very strict um, gun laws. It would allow members of Congress and the Senate to carry weapons, but would still keep um, private citizens away from being able to carry their firearms. Have you heard anything about this, and, and, and what's your view on it? Yeah, well, I, I did hear the initial inkling of that, and I, I personally think it's, it's the most hypocritical thing that I've, I've seen coming out in a long time. It's okay for us to have a gun because, you know, it's rough out there, and, and danger might be lurking around the street for us, but for common folks, you just have to deal with it with no gun. I think that is the, the most double-faced double, sta double, double standard I've, I've seen in a long time. Um, sometimes in a, a tragedy, in, in a, you know, I'm not trying to say anything negative against the, the, the folks that were shot, because God bless them, they, they were, they were, you know, went through a very uh, traumatized thing. But um, to turn around and start saying, you know, we need to have guns just for us, um, you need to look at the whole society as a whole and say, you know, we need to do something that's going to protect us all evenly and, and equitably. Uh, so I, I, I totally disagree with that type of legislation. We all need to have guns. Who, those of us who can legally carry a gun and know how to be responsible, it's okay to do that. But uh, just for a set specific elite group, I think that's the that's the worst thing ever. Okay, okay. Um, and, and also, I want to talk to you about you know you say you know you have a, a, a strong history experience um, with firearms. What are your some of your preferred firearms when you go into the range to get some uh, some practice shots in? I'm I'm real. I'm a basic guy. I, I I love the Glock. I like a Glock 19. I'm a Glock guy. It's a very strong basic gun. Um, it works every time. I I tell everyone it's like a Toyota. When you go to it and you pull the trigger, the bullet comes out. It's very dependable. You can put it in water. You can put it in dirt, shake it, wipe it off, and it just keeps on going. Um, and I I like going to the range and not having any you know uh, blockages on my on my when I'm shooting any type of uh, challenges. I'd like the gun to go and and work. You know, from a functional standpoint, very easily. Um, in terms of rifle, my long gun, I have an AK-47. I think that's the best gun out there. It's, it's, it's a reason why it's the most popular gun in the world. Um, very easy to learn how to shoot. It has an effective range of about 300, 300 yards. That's three football fields are right, are, are right around there. Um, and, again, like the Glock, uh, the AK-47, you can put it buried in the sand, buried in the dirt, um, just really put the gun through a torture test and pick it up, load it you know, with the cartridge, and it just shoots. So um, those are my two favorite uh, guns that I have at home and, and that I carry. I, I carry my Glock with me every day, um, and the AK-47 I have at home and when I go to the range. But th those are my two fi favorite firearms. There are, there are others. You know, Smith & Wesson has a nice gun. Taurus PT-111 um, is nice, but the Glock is, uh, is my favorite. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, why do you think our our military has shied away from using the AK? A lot of times you you see them with um, you know ARs or um, MPs, but I I rarely see our U.S. military uh, members of U.S. military using AK-47s. Do you do you have any knowledge or or, or idea why uh, an effective, reliable weapon like that is something that that we wouldn't give our soldiers? Well, I think back in the day, when I say back in the day, and I, and I bear in mind, I've not had any military background, but, but from the conversations that I've had with guys who've been in the military back in the you know Vietnam era, initially, the guns that, the carbine that was being used by the military on the U.S. side was not very dependable. And a lot of times, the U.S. soldiers would grab the AK-47s or whatever the enemy was using because it worked functionally better. But as time and, you know, modernization with technology, the AR-15s are now very, very good, um, and just as as, as um, dependable as the AK-47s. 
Um, the AR-15, just to kind of give you guys some understanding, AR-15s can shoot a lot further. They're like a Porsche. They'll shoot about five, 600 yards, whereas the AK-47 is more like a hammer. It'll shoot about 300 yards. Um, it's a lot more precise. I think, generally speaking, you have to be a little more delicate with the AR-15 versus the AK-47, but certainly um, the gun is, I mean, it's, it's rough, pretty rugged now, and as with new, every new generation of the AR-15, they get better and better and better. Um, um, they're just a really dependable gun now. So a lot of folks believe that the AR-15 is our superior gun than, than the AK-47 based on what it can do. It can shoot further, um, and in some cases, a lot of folks believe that is just as dependable as the AK-47. So just a matter of preference. There's a long, long ongoing argument between both uh, the AK-47 versus the AR-15. I'm just an AK-47 guy. It's very simple. I'm a simple guy. Like when I go, I grab the gun, I want it to work. Um, whereas some people like the AR-15, they want to shoot a really long distance. You know, four, five, maybe six football fields. You can do that with an AR-15 uh, pretty comfortably uh, if, if you have your sightings right and all that. So it's just a matter of preference. Okay, okay. I've I've, I've personally had bad experiences with uh, AR-15s. Uh, I actually was refer uh, shown the uh, the Ruger 5.56 um, and had a much better experience with that than the AR-15. So I've I've, I've kind of had my own personal uh, issue okay. with the AR. <laughs> That's just me, though. That's just me. Okay, okay. <laughs> uh, now, what are the bigger plans, like, for the NAAGA um, as far as, like, looking to expand the membership and opportunities for members um, of the organization? Sure. I, I think that right now we're in a good place. We've really had no hiccups, and we've kind of went through a kind of a Goldilocks period. Everything's worked out really well. We've grown a lot. Um, the, the, you know, if you look at our numbers, we're growing pretty fast every day, you know, 15, 20 people join nationwide every day. They're not Facebook numbers, but they're pretty consistent. My personal belief is that we should not look at the numbers. You look at the chapters because the chapters indicate grassroots growth at a very fundamental level, indicating to me from an analytical standpoint, I don't want to get too techy here, that black folks in different parts of the country are having the same conversation. I don't, and it'll go something like this. I don't feel comfortable out here based on some of the racial dynamics. I don't feel comfortable with the politics. I just don't feel comfortable about what's going on in society, so I'm going to get a gun. And more importantly, that's a lot of us get together and practice shooting the guns together. So basically that conversation is being duplicated all over the country. So when you look at the, the I kind of like the, the tea leaves for our organization, and you see the chapter growth go from four last year to 32 this year, it lets you know we're doing the right thing in terms of our messaging, our branding. Um, and so that kind of makes me feel, okay, I must be doing something right. I must, be, you know, as a group, we are going the wrong, going along the, the right direction. Um, some of the plans that we are thinking about doing, as I mentioned, we need to put together a legal strategy for our folks out in the community because God forbid if another Trayvon Martin or Philando Castile comes up, we would like to do, from, a, from an organizational standpoint, we would like to go to that family and say, Here, here's $10,000 to help with the legal fees. Here's $50,000 to help for the legal fight against this particular group or whatever. That's the long-term goal. Uh, in addition to that, we have a uh, plan, and this is something that, that is in the plans for 2019, 2018-2019, uh, we are going to have a scholarship program for graduating kids, African-American kids coming out of high school from single family homes only that are going to college. And we're going to have a scholarship program ranging from a thousand to $2,500 for each child that qualifies that has over a 3.0. Um, that's something that will be actualized and, and started next year. Um, we did, we tried this year, but we just didn't have enough infrastructure to get it started, but we believe that's the best way we can help the next generation learn about our organization by supporting them, but also, help them get through college because sometimes $2,500 is the difference between being able to pay for that at last little bit of tuition or buying a car so you can get back and forth to school. Um, so that, that's our goal. We want to help the next generation come and buy. So we believe that the legal strategy along with the scholarships is the, is the way we can best effectively help our community long term. So that, that's two plans that are definitely on, on the chalkboard. Excellent, excellent. I'm looking very forward to seeing more more uh, action like that. That's honorable. I like that. I like that. Um, up in Maryland, do you have any chapters in this area? Or are you looking to expand in this area? Yeah, we're looking to expand um, in the area. It definitely, um, 
are looking to it's a it's a very fertile area for African American shooting. So obviously we want to expand uh, in that area, and we definitely have a lot of members. We just need to get some more uh, chapters in that area to really get solidified. We have what we call interest groups. That's a group. Those are folks that are thinking about doing it, uh, but not uh, haven't quite made that last step to uh, start a chapter. But anyone that has a firearm background that is uh, knowledgeable with a gun and really has the time and effort and wants to start a chapter, just contact us and we'll definitely uh, get you started. And we have a process that we go through as a vetting process. And once you've done and went through that process, then you can go ahead and start the chapter and we kind of help you along the way until you're up and running and uh, have your own chapter. But that's definitely an area that we would like to really expand upon. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Uh, well, Phil, I want to thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to speak with us. Um, we got a little saying around here. Hope it's the first time. Glad it's the first time. Hope it's not the last time. Um, anytime, <laughs> anytime the NAAJ, NAAGA has anything going on that, that you want to talk about on air, you have a home here, you have a platform here, so you just um, you let us know. We appreciate everything that you and all of your members are doing, and we're looking forward to hearing and hopefully being a part of uh, things that you do in the future. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having the honor to, to meet everyone here and to allow us uh, to talk today and definitely uh, – uh, we're going to try to keep on doing what we're doing at a high level and make sure that uh, we're helping as many African-American folks across the country learn about guns legally and, and get trained. So so thank you. No problem. And before I let you go, uh, let everyone know where they can go to get more information on the National African-American Gun Association. Sure. Thank you. If anyone is interested in hearing uh, and learning more about our organization, go to www.naaga.co. Um, read over the information about the history of uh, blacks and firearms. Look at the, the tabs, and if you want to join, click on Join today, and you can simply pick which uh, plan you like to uh, utilize. Uh, you would like to pick, and uh, that's all you have to do, and we'll take it from there. Excellent. Once again, thank you so much for uh, joining us. It's Phil Smith from the National African American Gun Association. Uh, we'll be right back. Phil, you hold on for one second. All right. All right. Thank you. Legendary level, cause the flow was exceptionally special. The VS sky dweller, the necessary vessel, drop the bag to kill its own. He will definitely wet the rain. Yeah, that's just the loose change though. I'm comfortable on the same blocks where you came close. And lately I've been flowing like I ain't too sane though. Race to the top, watch me turn in the Usain boat. Whoa, we kept it grimy now. These niggas trying to jump with my cool lane. Only difference is you ain't dope. Behind the tents on the moose same, my new chain glow. And every nigga in my crew ain't broke, yo. I swear I used to move cane when Penny was calling itself two chain. This was a few years before two chains. No disrespect to two chains though. I'm just spitting the facts, so when niggas listen, they can't say the truth ain't spoke. Shot in my head, homie, but I'm rapping like I got a new brain. Plus, I get the kind of money you can't grow. The mighty GX app, screaming till I no longer breathe with rap. Get you hit with three in chest for a key or less. Raising your face, take a piece of flesh. They want me on freshman cover, but I'm a seasoned vet. I know niggas hated to see me progress. That my new album may Interscope want to reinvest. Yeah. You see, I'm back talking arrogant. My brother got a problem with niggas. I'm taking care of it. Road to success in the pens and West is steering it. I'm in the passenger seat, Aaron shit. I swear it, that's my word to the letters on back of my shirt in Arabic. Told you when I dropped reject, you better cherish it. Might bust down the road, he will double digit kerosene. They know this kind of flow, they can't compare to it. Got my bitch caught side at the queue, watching LeBron kill the Spurs. I ain't in the first, but got the chinchilla, his and hers. One of the illest pending words that you niggas heard. Every bar dope, equivalent to the shit I serve. Head on collision with death, homie, I didn't swerve. If this rap shit don't work, I can go get a bird. Number one question they ask is go drop the next. Mural was sitting in Australia and I ain't dropping yet. 
When I got shot in my neck, I told them I was next. They thought I was bugging, now they giving me my respect. Old bitches say I'm Hollywood since I got a check. Niggas label rappers, I got a check. Second most question I can ask is why Hot 97 ain't had me body flex. Yeah, probably cause I'm a threat. Might knock down a building like one of Osama Jets. Run through every rabbit till ain't nobody left. Give him the drum till ain't nothing in the shot he left. Nothing but fucking dead bodies left. Machine. New at 11, new details about one of the most notorious drug dealers, Griselda Blanco, killed anyone who got in her way. He had actually been chasing the ghost of Griselda for a decade. Griselda never showed on uh, the radar. Name was mentioned, but he was never physically seen by any of us. 